for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. We observe that there are about 50 single nucleotide mutations per generation across 6 billion nucleotides of DNA, which is almost spot on to the evolutionary mutation rate, if a bit too low. To support the young earth creationist mutation rate, in contrast, we would need to see 5,000 to 10,000 point mutations per generation. This is just far more than we actually observe. Jensen makes a case, though, that his far faster mutation rate is indeed correct, and he does so by referencing two papers that he dubs as the only two comprehensive studies on the subject of Y chromosomal mutation rates. Quote, to date, two published studies explicitly attempt to obtain the pedigree based per generation mutation rate for the Y chromosome. Both studies have reported the results to be consistent with the evolutionary timescale. Unquote. Of course, as we discussed earlier, this is simply not the case. The problems with Jensen's methods of getting a faster mutation rate and thus a shorter timescale are threefold. Firstly, Jensen's referenced high-quality studies have woefully high error bars. This is due in part to what Dr. Swamidas was discussing earlier with regards to coverage being paramount to a good analysis. Jensen's papers have pitiful coverage when compared to other studies concerned with pedigrees, meaning Jensen's own methodology and requirements of no evolutionary assumptions. Scali, for example, in 2016 performed a review that included 11 pedigree papers, all of which were consistent with evolutionary theory and an ancient timescale. Additional reviews have shown that by the time Jensen released his paper in 2019, there were already countless papers on the Y chromosomal mutation rate both alone and with the rest of the genome. Second, he forgets to subtract out the error when he computes the rates, which is what gives him that high mutation rate, which in and of itself renders his work on the subject entirely erroneous. The survey said... <laughs> Dr. Nathaniel Jensen goes through four... Y chromosomal mutation rate studies, two of low quality, two of high quality. Gutsick Gibbon links to the same Scali review that Dr. Joshua Swamidas has mentioned in his blog. It's really laughable, but it's also sad at the same time because when you look up these Scali references, and please do, I've pointed this out numerous times to Gutsick Gibbon. So let me reiterate it again. You won't find Y chromosome pedigree rates. You find autosomal ones. This is because the Y chromosome is very difficult to sequence. Why isn't Gutsit Gibbon? And why isn't Dr. Joshua Swamidas aware of this? I speak of Dr. Joshua Swamidas since this is where she got the argument. The thing is, the Y chromosome, it's full of repetitive and heterochromatic DNA. It also shares similarity with the X chromosome. Check out the paper Posnick AL 2016 in Nature Genetics. It's 1,000 genomes data. But what they did is they wrote a whole separate paper on the Y chromosome because it's so hard to analyze. What I mean is there's a reason why so few pedigree-based Y chromosome mutation rate studies exist. Anyone who has studied this issue knows this. And of course, if they were being honest, would acknowledge this. Now, it has been claimed by these critics, for example, Dr. Joshua Swamidas, that you need a thousandfold in terms of high quality versus low quality sequences. It's pretty obvious that Dr. Joshua Swamidas could not come up with even a single thousandfold mutation rate study, even if I were to offer him a million dollars. Only the mitochondrial DNA has achieved a thousandfold coverage in the vast majority of studies. The reason being is because it's so small. High quality by many studies is actually 30 times. For example, just have a look at the major commercial sequencing companies. Again, these critics, such as Gutsit Gibbon and Dr. Joshua Swamidas, appear to be out of their league on this one. It has been claimed by Swamidas, who Gutsit Gibbon gets her arguments from, that Dr. Jensen picked two low-quality studies. Again, he went through four, too high, too low. And Dr. Jensen showed that the low quality gave evolutionary mutation rates, but it was the high quality that fit the young earth creation time frame and fit the biblical model of ancestry. 
Now, just when you think it can't get any worse for these critics, it becomes clear that they have not read the work. They have not read the relevant literature because it is elaborated on by these critics that supposedly Dr. Nathaniel Jensen missed a number of pedigree-based studies. They'll say that he has ignored every study that covered the entire genome. When in fact, it has been pointed out that you don't just extract a Y chromosome rate by looking at the whole genome rate. The reason is because of the amount of repetitive and heterochromatic DNA on the Y chromosome. Extracting Y chromosome sequence from a WGS study is labor intensive, of course. Now you'll notice that when these critics such as Swamidas You'll notice that when they're discussing the data and utilizing their arguments, Swamidas, for example, never points to the place in these WGS papers that reveals the Y chromosome rate. It's quite apparent that he's never tried to extract the rate himself. Now, if and when he does, he will very quickly find out that it's much harder than it looks. Once again, Dr. Jensen is not ignoring these studies. This is a straw man argument and a misrepresentation. He is going with studies that have actually done a rigorous analysis of the Y chromosome. These critics go through theoretical reasons why people wouldn't look just at the Y chromosome. This is bluffing. Just look at all the published studies that do focus exclusively on the Y chromosome. Just look it up on PubMed. You'll see that these critics, what they do is they shift the focus to the autosomal rates again. They'll claim that it's 50 times less than the Y chromosome rates, as if the two are actually comparable. This is what happens when critics such as Gutsa, Gimit, and Swamidas attempt to speak authoritatively outside of their field. And finally, his work covers a very pitiful portion of the entire genome, just 0.005% of the mitochondrial DNA, or 1.8% being the Y chromosome. Listening to these critics, it has also become quite evident that they still do not understand why us creationists look to the uniparentally inherited DNA as the best way to determine ancestry as the best way to differentiate between the models, creation versus evolution. Creationists and evolutionists can both agree that the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, these DNA compartments being the non-recombining DNA, being the uniparentally inherited DNA, we can agree that the DNA differences are the result of mutations over time. When it comes to the nuclear DNA, Creationists invoke created nuclear heterozygosity, which actually makes sense both scientifically and theologically. Evolutionists assume mutations as the source for all DNA variety, as the source for all genetic diversity. These are very different explanations and views on the origin of genetic diversity. This is why the uniparentally inherited DNA compartments like the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA is the best way to answer this question of ancestry. The nuclear DNA can get rather messy, while the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA are a lot more stable, a lot less messy. Creationists are putting the challenge to the evolutionists. Creationists are the ones making testable predictions.